there are any questions, you can make them as hard as you want. <laughs> No questions? I guess... Uh, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Kaku, thank you for an uh, enlightening uh, talk. I have uh, three... Um, well, I guess... Cautions. Three cautions. One, as you do these uh, futuristic guesses, um, we should consider the negative consequences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second, um, we should not maybe emphasize so much only the consumptive uses of the technology. And three, I think maybe we should take into consideration culture that is it is important to know how the people who, in fact, wish to use these technologies and not just go on the basis of the potential of technology. Okay, well, let me try to address that. Yes, you're absolutely true. Science is a sword. It's the most powerful sword we have. But it can cut against you unless you're careful. However, think of the world of your grandparents. Your grandparents lived perhaps around 1900. What was it like to live in 1900? First of all, life expectancy for the average American in 1900 was 49 years of age. 49 years of age. You were born, you got married, had kids, and died. As they say, life's a bitch. Okay? <laughs> and long distance communication in 1900 was opening the window and yelling out the window. <laughs> high-speed communication and high-speed travel in 1900 was getting stuck in the mud with your wagon, if you had a wagon. And emails back in 1900 was waiting for the Pony Express, if it came at all. The point is, if you look at technology over the long term, not just in the short term, but over the long term, you see that life expectancy has exploded. That we can now communicate with each other in a way that we could never communicate before. But you're right, technology is a double-edged sword, like electricity. A hundred years ago, Edison had a problem. There were many people that did not want electricity. Look in the headlines of the newspapers a hundred years ago. Many people said that electricity will burn down homes. And you know something? They were right. Electricity burns down homes every day. And then they said electricity will electrocute people. And you know something? They were right. People get electrocuted every day. But you know something? We love it. <laughs> we love electricity. It's a trade-off. And so society has to make a decision about the trade-off of this technology. And also the digital divide. Remember that? People said they will be the digital rich who will have PCs, and the digital poor, who cannot afford a PC. Well, today, if you're a teenager, and you're not on Facebook, you don't exist. You don't even exist. You're, you're not a human, unless you're online. So the digital divide disappeared. Why? Because of Moore's Law. Technology gets cheaper every year. Mass production, better shipping, better containerization. So yes, it is a trade-off. And also, technology is not just consumptive. Look at these life-saving technologies. It's just not so you can consume hamburgers. It's so that you can have a better life without suffering. And for me, that's a good deal. Okay, next question. Uh, yes, um, I recently read your book, uh, Physically Impossible, and I'm actually wondering which is a technology you're most looking forward to? What is the technology I'm most looking forward to? Well, I wouldn't mind being teleported to Mars or teleported to the moon. I would hate to get in a rocket and be blasted off sitting on a million gallons of gasoline, wondering whether it's going to explode or not. So 
So I think te teleportation is definitely the way to go. However, it may take a few hundred years before we can teleport people. We can teleport atoms. In fact, I took the film crew to the University of Maryland. We photographed the teleportation of cesium atoms. So we do that at the atomic level. But a human consists of a lot of atoms. So don't expect we're going to be able to beat you up anytime soon. But it is a technology I look forward to. Sir, you talk about all these great things, but I ask you one thing, how do you expect to pay for it? There's only so much resources that we have. Not everyone can afford to have marriage full microprocessors, and people can't afford flying cars because you can only make so many flying cars. Okay, the question is, how are we going to pay for this, given the fact we have limited resources? That's going to be a real problem, because Hollywood movies have brainwashed us into believing that everyone can have hamburgers, everyone can have two cars in the suburbs, and look, let's be blunt about this, the Chinese are going to middle class, hundreds of millions of Chinese and Indians for the first time in history are entering the middle class. So there's simply not enough hamburgers. There's simply not enough steel, not enough wood for everyone to have a middle-class Hollywood lifestyle. However, think of the benefits of what they will have. They'll be able to almost double their life expectancy. They'll be able to have clean water without it being polluted. They'll be able to have electricity for the first time. That, to me, is a tremendous, a tremendous advance for human society. But you're right, there are limited resources. We're going to have to add new materials, new technologies to drive down the cost. And as I mentioned, mass production drives down the cost of commodities. This morning, you had breakfast that the king of Spain could not have had 100 years ago. This morning, you had delicacies from around the world that were refrigerated. Things from around the world. The king of Spain could not have had those delicacies a hundred years ago. That's how cheap things have become because of technology. Okay. Um. This is going to be hard. <laughs> How many years do you have, and what are they? What are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, the one theory that I have, and this is what I do for a living, this is my day job, is to work on something called string theory. In fact, I'm a co-founder of string field theory, one of the main branches of string theory. And we hope to, quote, complete Einstein's dream, to read the mind of God. That's the goal that Einstein set out. And we think that we have it. We think that matter in all its forms is nothing but vibrating strings. So that physics is nothing but the harmonies of these little vibrating strings. Chemistry is nothing but the melodies you can play on interacting strings. The universe is a symphony of strings, and the mind of God, the mind of God that Einstein wrote about in the last 30 years of his life, is cosmic music resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. We now have a candidate for the mind of God. So, that's my theory. Um, yes. Saying about the uh, like miniaturization of the of sources, ways to get onto the internet. And how exactly do you think this would be possible? Considering that even even at a certain point, we're going to get things so small that you can't you can't even put two atoms together and get them. Well, that is a problem. You see, Moore's law that you saw in the diagram is flattening out now. Nothing lasts forever. And even the miniaturization of transistors is heading for a dead end. Transistors depend on silicon. 
Silicon cannot work at the atomic level. Therefore, we need to find a new replacement for silicon. Silicon Valley could become a rust belt, just like Pittsburgh is part of a rust belt, unless the physicists find a new way to replace silicon. In your Pentium chip, there's a layer that is 20 atoms across. That's the smallest layer in your Pentium chip, in your laptop, 20 atoms across. By 2020, it'll be five atoms across. At that point, the uncertainty principle kicks in. Electrons leak out. Electrons leak out, and they generate too much heat. So this is the trillion dollar question. How do we replace silicon? This could create the next silicon valley. Trillions of dollars depends on answering this one question. And if you, if you ever figure out the answer, tell me first. <laughs> Okay, let's just have one more, and then we have to wind it up. Just one more question. Um, I was uh, interested in your complaint about uh, the human body having no air in the future. I wanted to have a grasp on your, uh, in of your insight about the field of therapeutics, like occupational, physical therapy, like speech therapy. Like, because if there's no air, how will that affect that field? Well. What I was talking about is genetic error inside a cell. So why do cells get old? Cells in principle can live forever. Cancer cells live forever. They just divide forever. But cells build up error after every generation. The buildup of these cells over time creates the aging process. That's why we get old. Now, you're talking about something a little bit different. You're talking about uh, physical therapy. If somebody's in an accident and suffers damage to an, a limb, then of course you do have to have physical therapy. Now, let me just say one more thing and then we have to go. If you go to a drugstore today, there are all these anti-aging creams, all these creams that say, take 20 years off your skin. It's all bogus. There's only one thing that really works. One thing that works in all these anti-aging creams. And that is moisturizer. So how come the FDA doesn't shut these fraudulent skin cream advertisements? And the reason is very simple. These do not penetrate the skin. Therefore, the Food and Drug Administration cannot regulate cosmetics because they don't penetrate the skin. But because they don't penetrate the skin, they don't work. So in other words, they can only say they are anti-aging if they don't work. Now think about that. You're only able to advertise anti-aging creams on the condition that they don't work. Think about that. Okay, well thank you very much. You've been a great audience.